In mainstream wrestling discourse, a lot of matches that I will see get praised tend to veer towards longer wrestling matches, and this is reflected in how a lot of bigger companies book. For the longest time, it was a near guarantee that at least one or two matches on an NXT takeover would go over 25 minutes, and New Japan have been really taking the piss with long times lately, to the point where they think it's appropriate to make a Toriyano vs Chase Owens match go 28 minutes. What? 28? It's fucking Chase Owens. 28 minutes, that's enough time for me to sit down and watch an episode of The Big Show Show. With time to spare so I can reevaluate my life decisions after watching an episode of The Big Show Show. Jokes aside, as you can probably tell, I'm not a big fan of this. I get why companies do it, they're booking to what their audience enjoys, but I feel this has created a false perception among some fans that longer matches are inherently better due to their runtime. It's not, and for my money, this obsession of going no shorter than 20 minutes has created a plague of cookie cutter epics completely devoid of any original ideas, just ticking off boxes to class it as an epic. Don't get me wrong, long matches aren't bad inherently, go watch my Shiri vs Utami video to see my more fleshed out thoughts on the matter, but today I'm hoping to show that short matches, in this case sub 10 minutes, can be great and can tell as rich a story as any 30 plus minute match. This match is electric from the word go, Ricky Marvin diving outside, catching Kenta off guard. With absolutely no weighted motion, he throws Kenta back into the ring, drop kicking him into the corner and hitting a powerbomb for the two. When Kenta won't go up for a brain buster, Marvin runs to the ropes, Kenta goes for a lariat, but there's this cool matrix dodge out, it's like fucking awesome. And that allows Marvin to hit a super kick, but in the distance created, Kenta hits a discus lariat. This would allow Kenta to hit his iconic corner dropkick and follow it up with a GTS but is countered into a Frankensteiner. Almost immediately Kenta goes for another GTS. Marvin would attempt to counter this in the same way but he went to the well too soon and Kenta counters that into a powerbomb. It's basically game over from here. Marvin would attempt to duck one of Kenta's kicks into a Le Magistral but Kenta deadlifts Marvin into one of the best GTSs you'll ever see in your life. And this was followed by a punt kick for the victory. I love how this match handles the jump start by Marvin. Matches that start during the entrances aren't an common in wrestling as it's a great way to get the crowd hot as well as establish a heel face dynamic. But 9 times out of 10, the hot pace set by a start like this won't be met as the match settles into a more traditional match structure. This isn't a bad thing because I understand why it happens. If the match is going longer, it would be unreasonable to expect wrestlers to match that pace for the rest of the match. But we didn't get that here because both guys only had 2 minutes to fill, so it wasn't that hard to match the energy created from the hot start. We get a complete story here. Marvin learns quickly but he can't give Kent space to throw bombs, and his desperation to prevent this led to him going for the same counter too soon after first hitting it, ultimately doing him in after he spent a lot of the match in control. Both men looked better coming out of this. They had to adapt on the fly to a pace you can't imagine they would have prepared for. For me, this is one of the best matches of 2009 without question. This match had one goal, and that's to re-establish Drew McIntyre to the NXT audience. He had re-debuted at a previous takeover, and this was his first match back in WWE after reinventing himself outside of the company. His first dance partner was Only Larkin, formerly Biff Busick, an extremely technically gifted wrestler who had settled into a job to the stars role on NXT TV. The match starts off pretty standard, with two locking up before Drew establishes himself very quickly with a big belly to belly, sending Larkin to the outside. Larkin takes advantage of this distance though, rushing Drew with a big European uppercut before hitting him with a tope suicida. He goes to the top rope to hit Drew with a big crossbody, which Drew catches, dumping him on the apron. At this point, it cuts to commercial break as we return to Drew dominating Larkin. Drew throws Oni into the corner, but Larkin cuts off his momentum with a boot. Using the ropes that are next to him, he jumps over Drew and hits a big running blockbuster. Larkin tries to follow this up by going to the top rope, but Drew cuts this off with a headbutt and follows him up. Larkin manages to force him into a tree of row position, but he waits too long to act, allowing McIntyre to sit himself up and drag Larkin off the top rope. Not wasting any time, Time, as soon as Drew is off the top rope, Larkin starts attacking him with vicious slaps. Drew manages to push him into the ropes where he catches him with a big boot and a reverse Alabama slam, giving him the space he needs to hit his Claymore kick for the win. Both guys did a great job in building this narrative. Larkin came off as someone who knew how to wrestle effectively against McIntyre, keeping out of his space and creating distance to outmaneuver the bigger wrestler to land bombs. This elevated a at that point glorified jobber to the point where he could upset one of the promotion's new big stars. That's not all that easy, and considering he was going to win the title later in the year, Drew was very giving here. He did that while showing his main strength, his size and power stopping Larkin at several points in the match. This probably won't blow your socks off or anything, but it is very good, incredibly effective TV wrestling.
Stardom's high speed division tends to be a haven for quick sprints. There's no set in stone rules with a division, more an agreed upon style among its competitors. Everyone just kind of moves fast and this tends to manifest in attempts at quick win through roll ups and submissions. The division was a barren wasteland for a long time after Hizuki drained. Def Yamasan held it for a hot minute before it being dropped to AEW's Riho, who went 10 months without defending the title. This could be put down to COVID, but she was still there for five of these months. It just never got defended. So when she eventually lost the belt, it was in desperate need of re-establishing. Azumi's reign did just that, making the high speed belt something meaningful for the first time since 2019. She's a wrestling prodigy, being one of the best wrestlers in the stardom roster while still being a teenager. Her matches with Starlight Kid and Marvelous's Mei Hoshizuki were absolute bangers. They went over 10 minutes though, so I'm going to talk about the match Azumi had with Natsupoi at Stardom's Tokyo Dream Cinderella show in March this year in the Nippon Budokan. Starts fast because it's a high speed match, neither woman succeeded and hitting any moves on each other at the start. Because of this there's a standoff but from there it just kind of becomes a fast match with cool moves. There's no real deeper elements to discuss like the previous two matches, it kind of just is a banger. It's two very fast wrestlers wrestling fastly. There's a big stomp to the outside that's super cool. Azumi keeps going for the armbar and that's a thread that never really goes anywhere. It's just seven minutes of cool shit and nothing I can say can sell it more than that so I'm just gonna say that and move on. There are a couple matches here I wanted a second opinion on and this is one of those matches. So to offer that second opinion, I have asked up and coming YouTuber Cherry Chase to comment on Kushida vs Hiromu Takahashi from New Japan Sakura Genesis show from 2017. Hiromu Takahashi vs Kushida is not only a brilliant subversion of the New Japan formula, but it cemented the status of Hiromu as the next face of the junior heavyweight division. Which is funny, because you would think that that match would have been their Wrestle Kingdom bout, and on paper that adds up, but it isn't until we get to their match at Sakura Genesis where we not only see Hiromu's status as the next face of the junior be cemented, but also the rivalry between him and Kushida progresses into much more interesting territory, starting with Kushida's decision to attack Hiromu before the bell ever rings, overwhelming him with a barrage of offensive maneuvers. In the words of Kevin Kelly, Kushida is trying to out Hiromu, Hiromu, but once the bell rings, Kushida's attempt at co-opting Hiromu's strategy proves to be his downfall, as Takahashi is able to counter and put away Kushida in less than two minutes, which was a result that sent me along with the crowd into total shock. Wrestle Kingdom 11 was the first ever full-length New Japan pay-per-view that I had ever seen. So going into this match, my expectations were set on seeing these two trade high spots and signatures in a 20-minute plus match, similar to the original bout at Wrestle Kingdom 11. But instead what we got was a desperate Kushida. A Kushida who saw that when they were on equal footing at the Tokyo Dome, Hiromu was able to get the best of him. So following that, he attempts the daredevil style that Hiromu had become synonymous with since his return, only to lose in less than two minutes because he allowed his desperation and out-of-the-box strategy to get the best of him. Cementing the danger that Hiromu is able to unleash in such a short span of time, it established the uncharted waters for the direction Kushida would choose to go into their next match with, while showcasing Hiromu as an unbridled monster that could take down the top dog of the division with blissful ease. As Cherry mentioned, his perspective was one of someone who was new to New Japan at the time. This stands in contrast to me who had been a fan of the promotion for about two years at this stage. In that time New Japan had been and in many ways still were making a big push to make Kushida the ace of the junior division. The last few years had seen juniors leave the division left, right and centre. Kota Ibushi had moved up to heavyweight just before I started watching. Kenny Omega had moved up to heavyweight to fill in the gap left by AJ Styles. And the likes of Prince Deva and Masquerade Dorada had left for the WWE. So New Japan made the conceited effort to build the whole division around Kushida. Tournaments like the 2016 J-Cup were booked specifically to get Kushida over. It kind of worked, but to be honest, Kushida was a fairly boring ace figure despite being a fantastic wrestler. So Hiromu, and more specifically this match, was the shot in the arm the division needed. As Sherry said, this was the defining match for Hiromu. There was no better way to go over him or his style. No one wrestles like Hiromu. He's frantic and impossible to plan for, especially when he first broke onto the scene. Despite Kushida trying to wrestle like Hiromu, who is not ready for his onslaught, this put over exactly how dangerous he was despite the fact he was already champion. It established Hiromu as a permanent fixture in New Japan, making the sub two minute encounter possibly the most important junior heavyweight match of New Japan's late 2010s boom period. 
Kings Road era All Japan is synonymous with long, epic matchups. Long, drawn out classics between the four pillars of Masawa, Kibashi, Taui, and Kawada that would inspire an entire generation of wrestlers across the world. These epics are classics, and they're classics for a reason, but they're too long for this video. So, what I want to focus on here is an undercard match between Pillar, Akira Taui, and fellow great in his own right, Junakiyama, on the January 20th, 1997 card in the Osaka Prefectural Gymnasium. It's an amazing sub fight minute affair that's buried due to having an old timer between Kabashi and Masawa in the main event. Match starts with Akiyama trying to go toe to toe with Tawe, but he's quickly overwhelmed as Tawe overpowers him with power slams and outmaneuvers him while running the ropes. It's quickly spills to the outside where Tawe drops Akiyama's neck across the barricade. He then tries to choke slam Akiyama to the outside, but Akiyama manages to escape as both men tumble back into the ring. Gun finally mounts a small comeback, throwing stiff strikes before nailing Tawe with a discus lariat. This doesn't last long as as Tawei powers through with a boot and a big German suplex. Tawei throws Akiyama to the outside again. He lifts up the matting to expose the concrete and once again attempts to choke slam Akiyama to the floor. But Akiyama tackles Tawei to create distance and both men once again get back in the ring. Jun goes for a German but Tawei escapes and he then goes for a choke slam but Jun managed to escape that and hit a running knee and an exploder for the win. This match has a simple narrative that you'll see throughout King's World canon and just wrestling in general. Akiyama struggles at first but through fighting spirit holds on finds an opening and gets a big victory. This is a match type we have routinely seen be stretched out to 30 plus minutes, but it worked beautifully in this more condensed setting. Akiyama quickly became a sympathetic babyface, meaning the pop and catharsis when he won was incredible. As I mentioned, people from his era are known for their capabilities for long epics. And again, most of those matches are classics. But the versatility of these wrestlers to be able to condense a story like that into five minutes shouldn't go unrecognized. This fucking ruled. This was Rey Mysterio's first major singles match in the Fed, debuting only a couple of months before this. Here he's paired off with Kurt Angle, former champion and someone who at this point in history has a good claim of being the best wrestler in the world. It starts off hot as Mysterio emerges from under the ring to hit Angle with a springboard head scissors giving the early shine to him. This opening sequence is fire, the highlight being a beautiful roll through into an ankle lock from Angle. When the ref breaks this up, it gives Rey Mysterio the opening to try and hit a 619, which Angle counters, giving the momentum to him. From here, the match settles into its routine, with Angle on top for the most part, but Mysterio finding small openings to use Angle's momentum against him, only for Angle to bomb Mysterio back into his place. It's the perfect format for an opener made even better by the fact that this match flows like water. Mysterio using Angle's momentum against him felt so natural. The way that Angle would get his momentum back felt very spontaneous and in the moment. There's also this great babyface moment from Ray when the ref stops him from diving to the outside of an angle so Ray jumps over the ref to hit a big tope. The match ends at its best point with Angle beautifully reversing a top rope hurricane Rana into an ankle lock for the victory. In this sub 10 minute match, these two had the crowd eating up the palm of their hands. It's hard to understate how big a deal this is for Rey Mysterio. In his first big match, he's shown to be able to go toe to toe with world champions like Angle, establishing him as a force to be reckoned with. Do you remember when New Japan had a variety of match structures in one show as opposed to the same suffocating main event style? Wrestle Kingdom 9, above all else, was a variety show. I mean, look at this card. You have a junior spot fest to kick off a show, some fun showcase tags, never slug fest between Ishii and Makabe, and the top three matches all had such different stories and cadences that I could easily gush about each of them all day. It was my first New Japan card and it kicked off my five year love affair with the company. And nestled in the middle of it, there's this gem between two fun former MMA fighters and shoot style veterans Minoru Suzuki and Kazushi Sakuraba fighting in a UWFI rules match. The match starts as you'd expect with both men grappling, quickly jostling for position, both men trying to gain any advantage over the other. Both men seemingly had an answer for whatever hold the other man attempted. This opening sequence being ended when Suzuki managed to roll through a sharp shooter to get both men to the ropes. With Sakuraba in the ring and Suzuki now on the apron, both men have a strike exchange. This allowed Suzuki to grab one of Sakuraba's strikes into an armbar across the top rope, dragging Sakuraba to the outside. Suzuki takes Sakuraba to the long Tokyo Dome ramp where Sakuraba gains control, striking Suzuki down and locking him in a key lock. The ref breaks this up, making the two men get back in the ring. Once there, Sakuraba kicks Suzuki's freshly injured arm. Suzuki dodges a Sakuraba slap to hit a series of shotes, knocking him down. Sakuraba strikes back, locking Suzuki in an arm breaker despite Suzuki's best efforts to hold his fingers together. Suzuki 
Suzuki manages to get to the ropes but almost gets countered out on the mat. Suzuki stands up to Sakuraba as he wails on him with kicks. Suzuki slaps him down and locks him in a sleeper to choke him out. This match rules. The desperation from Suzuki in the back half seeps out the screen and Sakuraba is amazing on top. This match remains compelling throughout with some great moments of grappling and striking. Make sure you don't sleep on this one. This match was on the first modern Noah show I watched and like, oh my god, fucking hell, this match. They start by having a small staring contest because it's a Vegeta match. The signs were there going into the Go match and we ignored them. Taniguchi then gains an early advantage by forcing Vegeta into the ropes and hitting him with a brutal slap, followed by a punt and dropping him on the apron. On the outside he constantly throws Vegeta into ring post before throwing him back into the ring. Once in the ring Vegeta avoids a Taniguchi punt. From there headbutting and beating Taniguchi down, splitting him open, it's fucking gross. He puts Taniguchi in a sleeper, which Taniguchi counters by just throwing him over his head and hitting him with a kick to the back. The two start forearming each other. Hard. Taniguchi introducing headbutts back into the equation, winning the exchange with a lariat. He then goes up and hits two splashes for the two count. He tries for a submission, but Vegeta deadlifts him into a Death Valley Diver, which Taniguchi no-sells but gets slapped down straight away. Vegeta hits a powerbomb and a series of sick punk kicks before choking Taniguchi out for the victory. There's no deeper layer here. This isn't great because of its structure like Akiyam vs Tawei or its ability to subvert pro wrestling tropes like Ricky Marvin vs Kenta. Just two fairly big men bombing each other till one is choked out. It's an easy to understand appeal heightened by the bleeding head of Taniguchi. At under 8 minutes is the perfect length for wrestling junk food. There's something about the first Josh Barnett's blood spot that stands out amongst the others. The atmosphere is great because it's a hot New York Mania weekend crowd. And it's home to some absolute dream matches like Hideki Suzuki vs Timothy Thatcher and Minoru Suzuki vs Josh Barnett. In this match we have technical wizard Jonathan Gresham against deathmatch standout Masashi Takeda. A man I haven't seen a ton of but I know him through reputation. The dynamic is kind of clear just by looking at these guys as a grappler Jonathan Gresham's going to be right at home and you'd be forgiven for thinking that Takeda Takeda wouldn't stand up too well in Bloodsport rule sets. But he more than holds his own against Gresham, forcing both men to fall out of a ropeless ring onto the floor not too long into the match. When we get back in the ring, Takeda is hot and tries to goad Gresham into a striking match, which Gresham tries to avoid falling for and tries to stick to grappling. Which doesn't last as Gresham starts throwing bombs in the back half of his match, hitting a lovely insiguri during an exchange. In the end, Gresham is knocked out by a punch and knee combo from Takeda. He really flopped to the ground here, selling it like he was legit knocked out. This match is really good. It has a lot of small narratives that develop throughout its short length. Gresham's surprise at Takeda's abilities. Takeda's anger when he's cut open. Gresham abandoning his game plan, leading to him being knocked out. This match is so dense at around 7-ish minutes. It's king shit. I fucking love it. This is the other match I've wanted an opinion on, so I've brought along fellow YouTuber Four Pillars of Hell to talk about it. What's up, it's Four Pillars of Hell here to talk about one of my absolute favorite matches. My story with this match is very similar to Chris's with Go vs Fujita. The first time we both watched those respective matches, we didn't really get the appeal until we watched it multiple more times and now it's both of our second favorite matches of the year. As I've stated in my 2005 video, I was recommended Samoa Joe vs Necro Butcher by Joseph Montecilio. I watched the match on my phone when I was going back to college, and honestly, I didn't really get it. I thought it was cool that CM Punk, Eddie Kingston, and Dave Prezak were all commentating together, and that Samoa Joe just destroyed Necro Butcher, but I didn't see it as a match of the decade contender. The knockout finish seemed strange to me, and nine minutes of brutality just to get to that point felt a little bit anticlimactic. I've watched the match at least 20 times, including three or four for this recording. Now, I think this match is the second best match of the entire 2000s, right behind Joe vs. Kobashi. The level of brutality and violence that Samoa Joe inflicts upon Necro Butcher is disgusting. Samoa Joe was dropping Necro Butcher like it was going out of style, and in the wake of research about CTE, it kind of is. This match feels more like a fight than anything I've seen before or since in wrestling, and a lot of that comes down to the fact that Necro Butcher just keeps getting up. No matter what Joe does to Necro, no matter how many times he drops him on his head, no matter how many times he hits him in the head, Necro just keeps kicking out. The commentary team of CM Punk, Eddie Kingston, and Dave Prezak literally lost their minds at some points in this match. Eddie Kingston said it was the first match on the independent scene to truly feel like a main event, and honestly, it might be. 
This is exactly the kind of match you should try and work with Necro Butcher. Nothing here looks controlled, nothing here looks staged, it's one of the most visceral experiences you will ever have watching wrestling. The second Butcher doesn't go over correctly for suplexes and power slams on the floor, you're just hooked immediately. There's some deeper story about Samoa Joe getting revenge for Necro Butcher beating up a bunch of Ring of Honor trainees, but the story doesn't fucking matter. I honestly don't have a ton to add on top of what Ethan had to say, but this is one of the very few transcendent things in wrestling. To bring up the Go vs Vegeta comparison, this is almost completely in the opposite direction. This match is almost overwhelming in how violent it is. There's not a moment of dead air, whereas Go vs Vegeta was basically half dead air. It's one of those matches where you're going to feel something. There's no way you'll feel nothing. If you're indifferent to this, I have to wonder if you ever watched it. I adore it. Most people in my little Twitter circle adores it, but if someone watched this match and fucking despised it i would not blame them i would not blame them one fucking bit but it's essential viewing for any wrestling fan it's so unapologetic in what it is and there's nothing again there's nothing deeper there's nothing you can really deep into other than it fucks but it fucks so hard it's free on iwa mid south wrestling's youtube channel and i think you should watch it i think you should watch all the matches on here you can pick any two of these matches and will be less than the length of this video Watch any of them and it will be clear that match length is in no way tied to match quality. Huh, okay, it's done. We're done. Finally, a happy video. My last, what, three videos have ended up being fucking serious. I have my Shiri vs Utami video where I'm explaining my dislike of something everyone loves. I have my 2020 video which is amending for my sins. And then I had my Stardom video which... It's about disliking something I've loved for several years. So, you know what? I just wanted a fun video. I did a fun video. <laughs> Let me live my life. Thanks to both Cherry Chase and Ethan from Four Pillars of Health for lending me your voice and thoughts. Cherry does more than just wrestling, but I highly recommend his Hokuto vs Kandori video. Cherry is some of the best editing on the scene. Just get on the ground floor. Go subscribe. Go, go now. Go. And Ethan is one of the most earnest wrestling fans I've ever met in my life. He is just so passionate about wrestling. It's amazing. He is purely wrestling and I would recommend his 2005 retrospective. Really good stuff. Me and him agree on what the best TNA match is. Which is good. It's, it's not the triple threat. You're, you're wrong. I'm gonna leave links to both of them in the description. Go check them out. They're both really, really good. If you want more of me, my Twitter's down there too, at Chris Loves Puro. I might turn this into a series. If you have any matches you think I should check out for a possible sequel to this video, put them down below. I might revisit it. I have a few bigger projects planned. This is just to like tide people over because I don't want to go like six weeks without a video again. <laughs> and that's it. Subscribe, I guess. I, I like seeing that number go up. Um, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.